You want me to start this off? You're not going to do another? Okay. He's such a good introducer. A hand for our MC. All right, those of you who just sat through the state of CPES, that was a warm up. That was to get you all in the groove, in the mindset of what's about to happen. Um, how many of you were here in October? So, how many of you watched my panel where, um, what'd you say to, last night to me, Roland? I really picked on somebody? Yeah, you're whipping some ass last time. Yeah. So. <laughs> A little history, I used to work for a professional hockey team in Philadelphia, our nickname was the Broad Street Bullies. Teams were more afraid of us when we went into their building than they came into ours because we always came in swinging. And there's no reason to, be, to, to leave the gloves on and to be polite. We're here to talk about where business is going, we're here to talk about what's happening in CPAS, and we're not here to hear about your company. The old days of Vaughn and Jeff Pulver, he actually had this big long hook and he would literally pull somebody off the stage if they started to talk too much about the company. We don't have that, so I'll just do an imitation of Hulk Hogan and drop them on their head. So, here, here's, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna have everybody who's on the panel introduce themselves. But before that, I wanna get a little breakdown of the audience which will help them shape their answers. One, how many of you are engineers, developers, coders? How many of you are product managers, business development people, or marketing people? How many of you are not in the industry and you came here to learn? Okay, that gives a good cross section. So, let's start first, and I'm still a gentleman. Ladies first, tell us who you are, who you represent, and why you're here. Sure, so my name is Stacy Stubblefield. I am from a company called Telesign. We do two-factor authentication uh, via voice and SMS. We also provide data around phone numbers. Um, and I am here partially to learn and see what other people are up to in this space, and then uh, partially to tell our story. Great. Now, to make it easy for the next one of three, who traveled the furthest to get here? I'm Toronto. You win. All right. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Hockey <laughs> town, see? <laughs> Tio, go ahead, David. Uh, David. <laughs> David or David Petromala. I'm with Abaya. I was part of an acquisition three years ago. I run the go-to-market for the Avaya public cloud team, and I focus specifically on their API cloud, the CPaaS platform. Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Intel. I'm um, the, the head of the CPaaS product line for uh, Ribbon Communications. It's a white-label CPaaS platform essentially for carriers, so uh, the likes of uh, the AT&T API marketplace, for example. And I'm Roland. Um, I look after the API group for Vonage. Um, on the product side. All right, so we'll start with Roland. Great. He didn't want to go first, I know that. Where's the growth been in the business? Um, I would say one of the earlier speakers um, actually alluded to it. I think the growth in the business has moved from uh, pure commoditized, let's say, messaging and voice, minutes and text. Uh, towards more solutions. So companies really looking at you know, how to solve specific use cases and kind of the end-to-end -end solutions. So that's definitely where, where we're seeing most of the growth right now. Phil, are you guys seeing the growth in the same place or are you seeing something different? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is um, a, a lot of adoption by large enterprises who are looking to embed within, uh, uh, within their business processes. So what we're seeing really is the adoption of, of APIs and communications in a new way by the, by the large enterprises. And so uh, I, most of what we're seeing is hitting contact center business first, but we're also seeing some of the world's largest banks abandoning, de uh, abandoning desk phones. So no more desk phone. What are they doing with them? Where are they sending them? Well, they're, they're basically moving into buildings and they're using their, their desktops. And in the case of some of the business uh, that, that, we're, that we're seeing, um, you know, banks are very security conscious. They have locked down desktops and uh, they're, they're looking for ways to be able to deliver real-time communications in as secure a way as possible. And you know, the, the, now that they're able to kind of get some of those applications on things like Citrix desktops and whatnot, it's enabling a kind of whole new generation of applications for so, them. So the rise of the soft phone, the, desk, the death of the hard phone. Death of the hard phone, yeah. Now, now Stacy, you guys have been at this longer than everybody. Long, way longer with TeleSign. You're probably the first CPaaS. I think you could probably claim that as the founder of the first CPaaS. Where are you seeing the growth? 
We're seeing growth definitely in business processes, so specifically as it relates to businesses communicating with consumers um, and getting rid of some of their manual processes or processes that would otherwise be handled by humans. So for instance, um, sending alerts to people or when someone is calling in, you know, trying to um, handle their call without having any intervention by an actual human. So that's, that's one place that we're seeing a lot of growth. We're also seeing growth in subscriber data, which I think is something that we're doing a little bit differently than most um, CPaaS players out there. But we're trying to give our clients more information about the person behind the phone number. And since we work with a lot of very large internet players who don't necessarily know that much about their user, especially when the user comes on uh, onto their uh, service for the first time, they need more information. And the types of companies that can really give them that information tend to be telecoms. And so that's, that's where we're seeing a lot of interest from our clients. Okay, but with GDPR, how many are familiar with GDPR in this room? Yeah, everybody, right? Yep. And now the California Consumer Privacy Act. Yep. How is that gonna change? So we obviously see or, or field a lot of questions about GDPR. GDPR is really just about keeping your data safe, giving the consumer control over their data, um, and, and that doesn't really stop you from using the consumer's data, uh, especially when it comes to fraud prevention. So that's, that's one way that we're handling it. Um, and we also see that whenever consumers tend to be more um, open to having their, their data used when it's in a protective manner. And so most of what we do is around fraud prevention, and so it's, it's not as big of an issue. What's the bias saying? In terms of growth or growth? Yeah, well, from our side, because we sort of incubated this whole thing you know, just a while back, growth is growth, right? So what we saw immediately was in the enterprise space, in contact center, really it was around digital engagement. So the the ability to take APIs and modify what they had was massive growth, but what we saw just in the last, I'd say, 12 months is, I agree with Roland, is solutions. So we're seeing more and more enterprises not wanting the Lego building blocks, but wanting the Lego set, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that help accelerate adoption to CPaaS, because the Lego set gives them a roadmap to sort of get it there, and then if they need to modify it, great, but you see more and more organizations taking it as is, and then because it's cloud and agile, what works doesn't work, and modify on the fly. So solutions and that framework seems to be the growth space for us right now. Sounds like he attended the last session where I said that. <laughs> so now that we understand all that, what sector of the business market is growing? Where, what companies or what market sector the ones are saying, I want to reach out and hug this CPAS concept. I can't live without it, and I need it, and I need it now. So it's a good question. I don't think any sector says, I love this CPAS, I need to embrace it. What they're saying is, I need to engage and be involved with my customers. So what, for example, what we've seen is retail is one of this massive segment that they need to be constantly engaged with their customers over and over. CPaaS or framework, whatever is giving them the tools to do that at a quick and agile sort of manner. So we've seen massive growth in retail. Um, the other one which was surprised me, and I think there's a massive market opportunity, was you know um, healthcare and medical because of the security and the compliance. But what we saw was a massive adoption about engage again patient to doctors facilities engagement is massively impart important in the healthcare sector. So you're seeing tons of investments in trialing, using, and addressing that segment. And what you're seeing is an opportunity for those CPAS providers that want to look at compliance and compliance issues around healthcare. There's a huge global opportunity in that segment. Which of you guys, the three of you, are involved in healthcare? How are you guys handling compliance? Uh, painfully. Painfully. <laughs> um, it's painfully is a naked man sitting on a chain link fence and somebody comes by and pushes him backwards. That's painfully. Well, that's why some of my products get used. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's something that just has to be worked through. Um, you know, we have to, uh, in the segments and markets that we operate in, obviously we have to comply, uh, for instance, like Talkbox being HIPAA compliant for, for uh, medical verticals, but it is just something, it's like GDPR. I mean, I don't know how many people here were involved in the, uh, the GDPR uh, compliance race, um, I, you know, probably quite a few st still have the battle scars. Uh, these are things, these are things that just have, have to be uh, built into the businesses. Um, 
I think from a uh, user perspective, uh, it makes customer experience sometimes a bit more challenging uh, because uh, there's extra steps in terms of uh, user experience or customer experience. Um, but no, it's something that we have to work on. It has to be done. Phil, where are you seeing the consumption? What group? So I, I think industry-wise, um, financial services and medical are definitely in the lead. Um, the other major sector that we're seeing is multi-branch retail. Um, although that one's driven by, by huge adoption of, of UCAS, and then a whole suite of applications that they're interested in that tend to be kind of CPaaS type, type based. So let me try and bring that down from the 30,000 foot level to five feet. Is that to fill gaps that the telco or the UCAS provider doesn't have a service offering and they need something so they come to you guys and say, we have this gap, what are they doing? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to your point about contextualized communications, which is that all, all businesses are basically looking for a way to kind of streamline their business operations and, and to embed communications within the processes. Um, it gives a better end customer experience. It helps to kind of uh, make the business more efficient. The problem, though, tends to be that um, when, when companies are offered bare APIs, they don't kind of really recognize what it is that they're being offered or understand how it is that they buy them or use them. So I think we're seeing a kind of a, a whole uh, move towards you know, simplified and kind of packaged type solutions that they can take to market fairly quickly and then adapt using the APIs to their own, uh, to their own back-end systems and processes. So what I just heard was the developers are good at building stuff, but they can't productize it. And you needed to productize it and bring it to market with a wrapper around it that says, this is good for this solution. Yeah, I mean, we, we started selling CPaaS about five years ago, and the customers that we went to talk to just didn't quite understand what an API was. And I think it goes back to the point that you were making earlier about uh, you know, the generation of CPaaS 1.0 what was all about kind of evangelism and kind of uh, educating the customer. Um, but what we found was that even by making small kind of demonstration type applications, you managed to get to the marketing teams, to the business teams, to the folks who are trying to solve real types of business problems. And some of those you know, early experiments that we had just from you know, marketing initiatives have evolved into full-fledged products as, uh, as customers have said, yeah, I like the concept of the APIs, but I really want you to give, you know, give me something that's going to kind of uh, uh, work out of the box. Well, this is great that we know where it's been. Where's it going, Stacy? Um, where is CPaaS going in general? Oh man, so that's a great question. Um, we definitely see people adding more intelligence. I mean, as we've been talking about, definitely higher level solutions, so um, not necessarily needing a developer, no offense to all the developers here, uh, to create a solution, adding in artificial intelligence so that things can be done without a uh, human is definitely a place where um, where CPaaS is moving, we see, um, as you were sort of talking about a little bit earlier, some of the big player, like the big cloud players, we see moving into the space and offering uh, high-level solutions in conjunction with some of the other solutions that they have. So, for example, AWS has a bunch of different solutions, and they're moving more into the CPaaS and telecom space in general. So, we see a whole host of things going on in the industry. How many of you have heard the words digital transformation? You know, I go back to what our opening keynote was talking about, punk CX, and I used to spin punk records, so in the, in the 70s, because one, I had a job so I could buy them in the States, and two, I had friends who were doing a show, so because I had the records, I got to do the show too. And I remember that whole movement and how it stripped everything down, and yet we had digital transformation was this big term, when really all it was was making things work in the digital age. Roland, how is CPaaS playing into this whole digital transformation? Is this because I put digital transformation in my response? Yes. <laughs> I think so. Um, That's why I right. the question. You're right. um, if you don't want to answer, it's okay. <laughs> digital transformation has, was you know, one of these overloaded terms um, that probably has been abused over the years. But for our, you know, we see a lot of opportunity in that space. Digital transformation, I think, is moving um, from a procurement strategy to an API strategy. I think that's the fundamental difference. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, CIOs or, or, or CTOs are, are no longer tasked with, hey, can you buy a bit more of this stuff for cheaper? 
Um, that doesn't really make sense anymore because people are uh, overtaking them. The digital natives certainly are taking them. You think of like the revolution, the transfer wises that you that you mentioned earlier. Uh, so they really need, you know, um, in order to transform, in order to uh, keep up, they really need to have to adopt uh, an API strategy as opposed to just a pure procurement strategy. And probably one of the areas, you know, where we're going with this is um, uh, kind of the theme of, of, of this conference, you know, contextual communication. I think we'll move far more to things like conversational interfaces. You know, everybody predicted the death of voice um, when, you know, the OTT started getting greater and greater share. But, you know, we still speak as human beings to each other. You know, we communicate. Uh, the best relationships are, are, are created through great conversations. So I think, you know, conversational interfaces, voice, all that kind of cool stuff is, is where we're going. Voice hasn't died. What's just simply changed is what service it goes over and who you pay. Right. It used to be what wire it goes over and who you pay when Vonage first launched, because yeah. instead of paying the telco, you were paying Vonage, it's coming over your cable line. The, but digital transformation and CPaaS, and what I'm hearing, and, and you're in the front lines of this with Nexmo, is a little bit of taking the power back away from the so-called purchasing department or the IT department and moving it to the front lines of who really needs to know and have the services that work, which is a little bit of what I heard from our opening speaker. Where are you seeing that within Nexmo, and what are some really good examples of customers who've said, forget the IT department, forget the purchasing department, this is what I need, and this is what I needed to do, and I needed to do this yesterday? Yeah, so that's, good. that's a good question. So. Um, some of our customers uh, are involved, let's say, in the contact space. So typically, it, it would have been, you know, how do we how do we scale this business? Oh, let's just, you know, add more seats, or uh, let's add more boxes. Hence, you know, the procurement would generally be driving almost the customer experience. Customer experience, obviously, is becoming so so important in terms of uh, purchase decisions that we heard earlier from Adrian. Um, and you know the velocity of being able to deliver those is is, is moving to um, to the other um, other departments. So, for instance, um, in the contact centers case, we're seeing companies utilize some of our products and utilizing augmentation. Uh, so, uh, you know, agents receive calls um, using our APIs and third-party APIs through our partner program, um, having augmentation. Uh, in, in terms of suggesting uh, based on sentiment of those calls. So, you know, procurement would never be able to solve that kind of problem or solve that kind of um, uh, user experience. So I think that's where we're starting to see the shift in, in momentum now. DP, where are you seeing the shift to the growth? Of CPAS? In CPAS in a specific sector. And is it verticalized or is it horizontal? Well, obviously I mentioned vertical markets that are so involved in customer engagement that CPaaS makes common sense. But the reality of it is, every industry is being disrupted. So digital engagement is not an option, it's a requirement. We're seeing it everywhere, from SMB, mid-market, all the way to enterprise. Now the way they consume and leverage CPaaS is different. My philosophy, or where we see this is, today we talk about siloed technology, UCAS, content, you brought up that slide with all those acronyms. The reality of it is, is it's, it's all bogus. Really, it's digital engagement. And what you'll see is the morphing of all those technologies to be one type of sort of, I'll call, service that companies pick and choose what they need. And what you'll see is a lot of those overlying products will be built on the foundation of a, I don't want to say CPaaS, but that type of architectural uh, cloud service. And we're already seeing it today. When, when you look at partnerships, the other big thing is not one provider, CPaaS provider, can go to market and say, we do this and we're going to grow exponentially just on this one service. Where we're seeing massive growth is partnerships. So, for example, healthcare, we partner with Mendex. Why? Well, they're, they're basically the developer community in that healthcare segment. We're providing valuable services to augment and help them have a broader segment. Uh, partnerships with the big guys like Google. I mean. AI is massive growth. Like, mm -hmm. If you look at what we do in retail, especially around CPaaS, AI is becoming, uh, I'll call it, you know, a mainstay. They're not going to look at an investment in digital transformation unless AI is part of it. Well, we as Avaya, yes, we have AI technology, but to say that we could deliver best of breed is a tough task. So what we do is you partner 
with the likes of IBM and Google and Amazon. So pe people can pick and choose what they need. And that partnership or building an ecosystem, even we, we partner with Nexmo in some segments, right? Is the idea is to be able to deliver more at a broader growth to a horizontal market that all require digital transformation to ensure that this is gonna be successful. And the reality of it is, is that's what I see, is that it's not a siloed CPaaS story, it is a collaboration engagement story that's gonna cover everything. So you guys are frenemies. Yeah, you know, like, he probably not aware of it, but we do, we <laughs> leverage in international. So for example, I wanna grow, people wanna have access to my technology in different markets that we're not quite there yet. I'll partner with an Exmo, right? To give me some foundation or expansion, or uh, early on there were some APIs that maybe we weren't ready to expose. We'll partner with a, uh, another vendor that has APIs, so our community doesn't get halted and can't go further. Are you really helping them grow? And, and we also know that they <laughs> we help everybody grow once already, we, we help maybe everybody. twice. But I agree 100 percent with uh, what David's saying. Um, and just to plug my colleague's uh, talk, so so Mark Summerson's. Um, to giving a talk later about the partnership program um, at, at, at Nexmo. But you know, I, I even see the partnership program as kind of the second pillar of our product organization. Is that important? Okay, so we, we see where some of the growth is coming from. But we all know that there's a lot of blues, pain, and agony associated with growing any business. And trust me, 47 exits, I know, and I have the scars of the companies, and then sleepless nights, and the wondering if we can ship this on time, and will the market like it, and is the media going to cover it, and will the analysts be available to be talked to so we can get some endorsement, and do we have the beta customers lined up yet? There's a lot to take this idea that's built on a CPaaS platform that be, that's gone beyond the developer stage, and it's now incubated, and it's now productized, and service creation is one of the terms you hear about. Productization is another. Go to market. And yet, it's like pushing the boulder uphill. <laughs> what are some of the limitations you're seeing, Stacy, to the exponential growth of CPAS? You know, it's a good question, and, and I, I saw this question, and frankly, I couldn't think of anything. I just, I see CPaaS growing so much, it seems like, like exponential growth to me. So I'm not sure that there is that much limitation at this point. As you guys were talking about earlier, a lot of companies have no choice but to integrate communications into their business processes, into the way that they communicate directly with their users. Uh, people expect now to be notified on a regular basis when something is happening. People expect this very personalized communication with businesses. People expect to be able, in the sharing economy, to be able to talk to each other via um, you know, various forms of communication. And we've seen all of that integrated uh, into, you know, into various different company backends, into the way people use services, and so, I mean, I guess the limitation at one point was having enough developers, having enough time to develop something, um, just you know, uh, enterprise cycles of integration. Anyone who's in sales knows it takes forever <laughs> to actually <laughs> get, uh, get an API integrated in somewhere. So now that we have um, these solutions where people can go in and just drag and drop, it's very simple. Uh, to use, it makes everything much faster. So I don't see a ton of limitation, and most of the limitation that I do see, frankly, is just business limitation. So for example, I know a lot of companies that want to integrate WhatsApp into their, um, into their you know, flows. And WhatsApp can be, uh, let's just say that they're taking their time integrating businesses. So, but that's really a business decision on their part. That's not any kind of technical limitation, that's, that's just them making that decision. So, that, that's the main um, thing that I see holding, holding integration back. So in that case, the lack of openness right. is exactly. a limitation. Exactly. Okay. Phil, what do you guys see? Well, we, we try to kind of bridge the gap between the carriers and um, the, the customers that are wanting APIs these days. So our job is basically extending carrier networks out and their services out. Um, and, and so the limitations that, that we tend to see are those 
old style back-end systems and the ability to be able to tie into existing billing systems, existing provisioning systems, the fact that carriers don't necessarily have APIs internally for a lot of the services that they actually offer. So being able to sell phone numbers, for example, can be quite a challenge when they come to you on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, 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 can be, uh, it, it can be very time consuming and challenging for an organization to kind of scale and grow when uh, you're dealing with, you know, multi months or multi years of integration schedules and very large brands and legal and uh, uh, departments. But those companies realize they have to respond to what their customers are asking for, which is the ability to embed their communications. Otherwise, they know that those customers are going to go and get them elsewhere. It's really funny. He talks about the telcos. So the survey that 5% of you answered, <laughs> almost 75% of the comments were aimed at the telco. It's like, you know, it's like they're a pinata. You don't know what a pinata is? You go around and you hit it and you hit it and the candy falls out. Well, a lot of you all thought the telco's dead, the telco's on life support, telco doesn't know what they're doing, telco can't get anywhere, Telco is going to be replaced. These are the kinds of comments we saw. And this is true. The telco is dead. The telco is on life support. The telco is being beaten by startups every day. And I don't consider Vonage a telco. I consider them an information service provider because they've branched out to do so many things. And if you ask executives at AT&T five years ago, they would have told you they're an information service provider. They gave up being a telco. We know the telco is here. I'm not going to do an imitation of Freddie Mercury and bend over backwards, but literally the telco has hit that wall. They can't innovate. They can't initiate. They need to go to this group and that whole other group on the slide of the, the future, all those guys. All of the telco's customers would have gone to the telco. I used to say in the, in the dawn of VoIP, Every one of these services that you're selling, and we sold lots of them like Grand Central that got bought by Google and High Def Conferencing got bought by Citrix and others, which is now go to meeting was sold again, that the telco, if they bought it, wouldn't have lost market share to the new guys. Their top line revenues would have been higher, not lower. Nobody would have left if you gave them what they wanted. But the telcos aren't adding it, is what I'm hearing. Where are you guys seeing that you're adding value to the whole communications ecosystem? What, you know, what's the value add? And, and basically, what's the subtraction from the telco? Because if you're getting the money, they're not. Yeah, well, they got to send the money. Um, just on the telco's dead thing, I think we've, we've kind of heard that for the last 10 or 20 years. Um, a bit of a soft spot for the telcos. Um, if you, if, I think if you see them as utilities, uh, and, and utilities can still evolve, and maybe they don't want to be utilities, but I think the, the dead part is them becoming utilities. We'll, you know, there'll still be a need for people setting up you know, fiber, fiber rings and microwave links and satellite links, and assuming Elon Musk star like project doesn't uh, pan out. Um, so what do we bring? I guess it's the um, democratization of communications, fundamentally. Bringing uh, web scale, web skills to, as you said earlier, you know, build your own telco, which is like insane if you think about it. It's really crazy. Um, but mainly I think, and it comes back to the whole uh, user experience, customer experience part. Uh, brands used to expect customers to communicate with them on their terms or their social graphs. Things have changed. Um, consumers, digital native consumers, want to communicate with brands on their social graphs. So I think, you know, CPAS, uh, you mentioned WhatsApp earlier and how easy they are to work with. Um, you know, those, uh, those over-the-top services, those new social channels, I think, is where CPAS really starts adding value. So conversations, Another buzzword for you, omnichannel, mm -hmm. I think all those areas. Again, our opening speaker would have said, stop the buzzwords and bring it down. Stacy, 
what is CPAS replacing? I mean, what, what were the customers buying before that now they don't buy the same way? That's a good question, but I'm gonna go back a little bit. I don't bit. ask bad ones. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna go back a little bit to what you said before, because I don't 100% agree that as CPAS grows, that the telecommunications companies lose out. I actually think that in many ways, we're adding to um, the business of the telecommunications companies because we're making it much easier to work with their services than was otherwise possible. I don't know how many people in this audience have ever tried to contact a telecom directly and do business with them. It's not an easy task. It's not a fun task, exactly. This, this is how you feel most of the time whenever you're doing that. And so we've, I actually remember way back in the day, we used level three as a vendor, as our very first uh, voice vendor. And we literally had to beg them to be a client. We had to go in and ask them multiple times, like, please let us connect to you. Please, we want to give you money, like, please. And it was very, very difficult because they really didn't want to do it. Uh, we finally was that when they had the hundred thousand dollar a month minimum? Well, something like that. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Which came down from the million dollar a month minimum. Yeah. So I mean, these these companies. I mean, if you're doing billions of dollars a year, like a small, you know, a, a hundred thousand dollar a year client is is not something to spend time on, right? And so we've made it much easier to use their services. Um, and so we're bringing, in my opinion, we're bringing them more clients mm -hmm. and. Uh, more use cases than they otherwise had, and we're also explaining to them how their, uh, how their services are being used, because in many cases, they don't even understand themselves how valuable, well, they understand how valuable, let, let, me, let me take that back. They understand how valuable their services are, but they don't always understand the use cases and how they're being used. Okay, this is not beat up the telco. <laughs> but Phil, what are you guys replacing? Well, fundamentally, I think what we're replacing is an older style of telcos doing business, which is built around that kind of monthly subscription type relationship and uh, a direct touch point. What we're seeing is that digital transformation of carriers to offering out transactional, to offering out self-service types of, of services. And it's not just about providing CPaaS and APIs, it's they're, they're kind of jumping on and trying to bring all of their lines of business and trying to focus them into, uh, into a similar kind of service model to their customers. And so I think what we're replacing is uh, an old style, vertically integrated uh, telco um, where uh, different lines of business uh, aren't able to kind of you know, interoperate uh, within their own customers. And uh, we're seeing that kind of kind of normalized in a way to reach the needs and the purchasing behaviors of, of uh, the customers that they have now. And we're replacing um, an older culture uh, as they begin to learn about selling. So I think what we're seeing is that you know, CPaaS was, was revolutionary for the customers and developers five years ago. Now it's being revolutionary for the old style telecoms industry as they learn what it means to do business in that world. Isn't that like keeping up with the Joneses because they've been losing the business and they've been seeing the money shift to TeleSign, to Nexmo, to Plevo? Well, guys like that? And well, there's no question that we've seen a real change in the last two years in the attitudes of our customers, uh, of the carriers themselves, um, where you know previously uh, a company like, like Twilio was seen as kind of something a bit interesting, but uh, you know, a bit like an insect. They don't quite fully understand it, and they're not quite sure whether it's going to bite them or not. Um, and now they feel the bite, right? Their large customers are beginning to... Uh, to, to rapidly adopt, you know, communications and to embed them into it and to adopt new ways of doing business. And they've realized that they have to change in order that, for that to take place. So we're seeing, just within the last two years, a totally new approach where time to market is key, where uh, the idea of using public cloud telecom services or, or service providers to bring your network to market, you know, was, uh, was anathema to, uh, to some of these companies. And now it's like, yeah, we've got to get out there. It's more important that we deliver uh, in the, the model that our customers are demanding and that we get to market quickly than it is that it runs within our own network. So it's a total cultural shift. So without talking about yourselves and without 
talking about anybody else up on stage. I want each of you to talk about who you see as the rising com competition in the CPAS space. Who are the rising stars that are changing the game? And as an old colleague of mine in the, my days with the Flyers would say, who's the per would ask, who's the company you hate to lose business to the most? Because that's the one that's usually the rising star. And if you don't ever know who you're losing business to, you're not in the game. So, who is that? I can't talk about myself? No. no. Um, so, you know, I see it from a bigger threat. So, I, I think that CPAS is evolving in the sense that you had the traditional framework guys now going up stack, and then you had the traditional people trying to remorph what they have and trying to go down stack. To me, that's not the rising star. Right. The rising stars are, you know, and I see them every day. I look at the, the looks of uh, Google and Amazon. You, you listed about four or five of the big players. Microsoft, they're really in the space already, but they don't really care that much about voice at this moment. They care about, though, engagement, customer engagement. And to me, that's what CPaaS is. It's not just about voice. Right. So those, to me, are the, the rising stars. They help us, but they also are massive assaults on the industry, They help you until they eat your lunch, yeah. they make you lunch. You gotta make sure as a company you're always evolving and creating value. So those right. are the giants. Who are the real rising stars? The, I used to call them rookies. You know, the, the guys are just starting. You know, they've been around, but now you hear about them. Roland. Hmm. So I can't talk about competition? Yeah, comes your competition. Okay, um, I'm be slightly Controversial, maybe dodging the question. Um, Answer the question. And I would say it's customers, actually. Like, if you think of some of the digital natives, customers that are actually adopting CPAS technologies and then extending them, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised if we, we start to see some incubated uh, rising stars out of, out of customers, especially the large ones. I mean, you can take it to the extreme. You look at people like Netflix who, mm -hmm. who drive, like, such an amazing uh, amount of cool engineering, mm -hmm. and then open source it, for instance. So that's kind of in the cloud space, but I see, I see a future where maybe that could also happen in the communication space as well. It's like Uber's building a lot of their own stuff. Yes, exactly. Uber was using all you guys, and less and less. Oh, I still use us. Less and less. Jason Droge can build a telecom system. He already did in the past. But exactly that. As well. yeah, he exactly. doesn't need you guys. Exactly that kind of thing, yeah. Okay. yeah. So you see that, you know, we work, companies like that, you know, get the connectivity from a telco or from a, a, a fiber provider, but build everything else yourself. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be surprised that like companies you wouldn't even think of have very large, um, very large innovation teams, digital innovation teams. I think Domino's is probably mm -hmm. the one that comes to mind for me. Like the kind of stuff that they're doing is, is pretty cool. Yeah, the pizza um, bot. Pizza bot, but yeah, on, 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 on all levels, right? Like, knowing where, where your pizza is after you've ordered it, um, which is kind of reflective. Well, they've learned from the, the digital engagement model that the big four have. And you know, we're all dopamine addicts, and we all want to be uh, updated every, every second about what's actually happening. So. Well, it's funny you bring up the pizza bot and the location, because we talked about location in, in, my keno, in my keno, but what that's done is that's eliminated people calling, where's my pizza? but they also have done it since they got rid of the 30 minute guaranteed delivery because they were killing people because the drivers were running over people, so no more 30 minute delivery guarantee. But at least now you know where your pizza is. What do you say? I agree with these two, frankly. I don't see any, I mean, I'm sure there are small companies out there that are gonna eat all of our lunch that we just don't know about yet. Um, but where we're seeing a lot of competition is from the big players like Twilio. Um, we see competition from the likes of AWS, potentially Microsoft, potentially Google. Google is doing some really interesting things when it comes to telecoms. Um, they clearly have aspiration to be a telecom themselves in the future. Um, and I'm not saying that with inside knowledge, I'm just saying that with looking at what they're, looking at the services that they're putting out and the direction that they're trying to go. So I think that they're definitely a threat. And I think a lot of the telecoms know that they're a threat in the future. So that's, I mean, that's really what we're seeing on our side. Google, to your point, is a telecom. Google Voice, Project Fi, Google Fi, Duplex, Wolverine, the integration into G Suite, Google, Microsoft, 
Amazon, Facebook, the Fangs. Don't rule out Salesforce. Don't rule out anybody in the CRM space because they're one step to you guys and you guys are one step to them and we're all connected contextually. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you very much to our audience. There's a wonderful break inside.